This is the story of Rwandair Flight 205. On the 12th of November 2009, at about 12 p.m., a CRJ-100 was on the ground at Kigali in Rwanda. The plane was going to carry 10 passengers and 5 crew members from Kigali to Entebbe in Uganda. The plane took off from runway 10 at 12.54 p.m. During the takeoff roll, they realized that the left-hand engine was stuck. They could pull engine number two back to climb power, but engine number one, the left-hand engine, remained at 95% no matter what they did. To troubleshoot, they entered a holding pattern above the airport. The first officer and a maintenance technician tried to troubleshoot the issue over the skies of Kigali, but with no luck. The captain then decided to land back at Kigali. They circled the airport as they lost airspeed and altitude. They had to go around on their first attempt. It's not known why. Maybe they were carrying too much speed. But on their second attempt, the plane touched back down at Kigali on runway 28. Once on the runway, they braked hard. The left engine, which was still stuck at max power, did not want the plane to stop. The brakes were working over time, and the tires on the left-hand side deflated due to the heat. But they eventually got the plane to slow down. The captain taxied the plane off the runway and to the parking bay. Once at the parking bay, they stopped the plane and began to shut the right-hand engine down. They had managed the crisis, and their plane was back on the ground. They thought that they were out of trouble, but they weren't out of the woods yet. In the cockpit, the pilots were still trying to get the left-hand engine to respond. They manipulated the throttles, but the engine still wouldn't budge. It was at max power. The pilots were still troubleshooting the issue, even on the ground. The captain wanted to get his passengers off the plane, but since the left-hand engine was running, they wanted to use the galley exit. Then, even though they had the brakes on, the plane started rolling. Here's a quote from the first officer. We landed safely and parked but the left thrust lever could not be adjusted still. As we were trying to shut it down while holding on the brakes, the plane started rolling again." End quote. The plane was moving again. They tried to stop the plane, but it just wasn't happening. The plane was rolling and there was nothing that they could do about it. The captain tried his best to turn the plane away from other planes on the ground, but eventually the plane crashed into the VIP terminal, killing one person on board. A witness nearby described the plane as uncontrollable. Within minutes, fire trucks were at the scene and they fired water into the engine to shut it down. Rwandair Flight 205 had ended in disaster. This crash, like most crashes, has a few layers to it. So let's go through them one by one, starting at the beginning. We need to look at what went wrong with the engine. Once the plane was freed from the building, they were able to examine the left-hand engine. They found what was wrong. A strut was loose. The cowl or the cowling or the shell of the engine is held in place with the help of support struts. These struts are held in place using brackets and clips. But this strut had somehow worked itself free and was loose inside the engine. The strut was in this awkward place. It was near the fuel control unit. The fuel control unit, as the name suggests, controls the amount of fuel that's sent to the engine. When the throttles are advanced, it sends more fuel into the engine, and that gives you more thrust. The opposite is also true. So there's this arm that has to physically move to control the amount of fuel that's sent into the engine. But the strut impeded the movement of this arm. With the strut in the way, the fuel control unit arm couldn't move that much, and so the fuel supply was wide open. This meant that the lowest power setting that the engine could achieve was 93%. But why did the strut come loose? The plane's maintenance history showed that it had been in the shop on the 10th of November, two days before the accident. In addition to that, they had worked on the left-hand engine. Did the technicians forget to secure the cowl strut? The plane had completed about six flights after the maintenance had been done, and they couldn't say with certainty that someone had made a mistake while securing the strut. So they ran a few tests on an identical plane. They found that there was a chance that the locking mechanism might not engage correctly and that the strut may come loose due to all of the vibration. So the strut came loose as the plane took off and obstructed the arm of the fuel control unit. That's why the engine did not respond. The interesting thing is that this wasn't an isolated incident. It had happened enough times before that there were a few service bulletins to alleviate this problem. 
On top of that, no one really knew that the strut could cause an issue like this on the maintenance team. Additionally, the manufacturer itself categorized this as a low service bulletin, so a lot of people may have just skipped it. That's the story of the strut. Let's now look at the next link in the chain, the pilots. The pilots had realized that the left-hand engine was unresponsive during the takeoff roll. They took off, which they thought was the correct thing to do. But once they got into the air, they began troubleshooting the issue. They eventually decided to keep the engine at max power and to land with the engine like that. Let me make this clear. They flew the plane beautifully. The report called out their ability to control the plane in such an abnormal situation. But they made a few mistakes. The quick reference handbook and the flight manuals had a TLJ or thrust lever jammed section. This checklist told them exactly what to do in case of a jammed thrust lever. It asked the pilots to get the plane to a safe altitude. It then asked them to hit the engine fire push. This would cut the fuel supply to the engine via a cutoff valve. No fuel, no engine at max power. But the crew deviated from the standard operating procedure and did not do that. They tried to troubleshoot the issue in the air, and when that did not work, they left the engine at max power. This meant that they came in hot for their landing. They were flying faster than usual. Once they touched down, they had to brake hard to bring the plane to a stop. Here's where they made another mistake. Once on the ground, they should have followed the airport's procedures for hot brakes. This would have brought emergency services to the plane as it taxied. Once on the ground, they had a sense of safety. They were on the ground safely after all. The captain's attention then turned to the safety of his passengers as they shut the plane down. Before we go any further, let's talk about the brakes on the CRJ. On the main landing gear, the inboard brakes are powered by hydraulic line number 3 and the outboard brakes are powered by hydraulic line number 2. We're going to focus on hydraulic line number 2 for now. The hydraulic line is powered by the right hand engine or engine number 2 and an electric pump called the ACMP. As we talked about before, this line powers 50% of the brakes on the plane. When the pilot shut the right hand engine down, the core started to spool down. This meant that the pressure in hydraulic line number 2 would drop. This in turn would mean that the brakes on the outboard wheels of the plane would be rendered ineffective. Now you might be asking, if the engine spooled down, why didn't the electric pump kick in? The electric pump would only take over if the ACMP switches were in the auto position and if the flaps were extended. Neither condition was satisfied at the time. This is when their fast landing doomed them. Remember they landed fast and they had to brake really hard to stop. This caused the tires on the left hand side to pop. Usually, when the brakes are applied with thrust present, there's this tendency for the wheels to rotate or revolve, but the brakes cancel that out and hold the wheels in place. But swap that tire out with a deflated one, and now the plane starts to drag the deflated tire along with it. There's nothing that the brakes can do to prevent the tire from being dragged along. So in essence, the brakes were less effective because the tires were deflated. Here's a quote from the report. After the tire deflated, the rolling traction no longer existed for the brake pressure to resist. Consequently, the left tires would have been mostly dragged across the ramp instead of being in a normal condition to resist rolling by the brakes. Essentially, once the tires were deflated, the engine at max power overcame the friction between the tire and the apron. So with the tires deflated and hydraulic line number 2 out of commission, the thrust from the left engine overcame the brakes on the plane. With that, the plane was rolling right towards a building. In this accident, a false sense of security made things a lot more dangerous. They had an issue in flight, and once on the ground, everyone assumed that the worst was over. When the plane was at a stop, a lot of the passengers were standing. They had been told to unfasten their seatbelts. This contributed to the severities of the injuries in the crash. It would not have been this bad had they been seated. This accident just goes to show you that you might not necessarily be safe just because you're on the ground. It isn't over till it's over. So, what do you think of Rwanda Air Flight 205? Do you know of any other incidents like this? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I'll catch you guys next time. 
Stay safe.